This video is sponsored by the book summary app, Blinkist. Use the link in the description and receive one free week and 25% off a premium membership. Imagine a hallway containing three different rooms. In each room, there is a person being experimented on. A captive subject to a rogue clandestine operation headed by the world's greatest, most intelligent neuroscientist. This neuroscientist has been contracted by an intelligence agency group to research consciousness, perception, and intelligence, all in an effort to develop new understandings and technologies related to the mind. In each room, we find brains running experiments on brains. Experiments run on thought. As we enter the hallway, we find ourselves at the first room. The door is closed and locked. Inside, there is a man named John. He is not allowed out, and no one is allowed in. He has been completely isolated for some time, provided food and water through a contactless delivery system. A woman who works at the lab has now recently been instructed to begin periodically communicating with John by slipping him notes under his door. She has not told anything else. She does not know who is in the room or why. One morning, after she begins following this instruction, John wakes up to a note in his room. He is both immediately curious and hopeful of what it might say. However, to great disappointment, when he picks it up to read it, he finds that it is written in Chinese, a language he does not know at all. However, John quickly notices that now also placed in his room are boxes full of papers, pencils, and erasers, as well as books containing comprehensive instructions for how to appropriately respond in Chinese to statements and questions the woman might write. In the books, John can locate and match the symbols the woman writes and then write the relevant corresponding symbols that the book provides, facilitating a conversation. At first, John is confused, but desperate for social interaction, he soon engages with the woman, writing back notes according to the book's instructions. As time passes, the woman begins to like and then fall for John, believing she is communicating with a charismatic man who is fluent in Chinese. Of course, however, John has no idea what he is saying. In this experiment, referred to as the Chinese Room, we find the following question being asked. What does it mean to be intelligent? With the advent and rapid development of digital computing and artificial intelligence, the question concerning when or if a machine could be considered intelligent, able to think and possess an understanding, is only becoming increasingly relevant. If John can convince the woman he is intelligent or fluent in Chinese, based on what he outputs from the room, but can do so without ever actually understanding Chinese and what he is saying, then the output of John's behavior is not sufficient in qualifying him as intelligent, or in this case, possessing an actual understanding of what he is saying. And so, likewise, if a computer program can follow syntactic rules well enough to provide an output that can convince a person that it is thinking and fully understanding, that does not necessarily mean that it is. This experiment challenges the philosophical positions known as functionalism and computationalism. Functionalism arguing that mental states are to be identified by what they do rather than by what they are made of. And computationalism arguing that the mind is an information processing system and consciousness is merely a form of computation. According to the Chinese Room's proposition, however, for intelligence of mind to actually exist, there needs to be understanding which is inevitably always missing from a digital computer. This poses the question though, what constitutes understanding? Obviously John understanding Chinese or not is essentially binary, but can John still understand what he is doing in the situation without understanding Chinese? In other words, does John's understanding of the fact that he is intaking and sending out messages in Chinese still constitute some form of understanding? On what level is a computational system required to understand what it is doing for it to be considered sufficient enough for intelligence? Is it a total, comprehensive understanding that is required? A partial understanding in a specific way? How does one determine this? How does one verify it? After all, do we, as humans, really understand what we mean even when we know what we are saying? Ultimately, if the door to John's room was suddenly opened and the woman saw John showing emotion and effort as he wrote his responses down from the instruction books, clearly understanding not the language but the significance of it, his role in the exchange, would this change things? Would the woman still find him worthy of love and possessing of a sufficient enough understanding to be intelligent? 
Likewise, if a machine functioned as if it understood, behaved as if it did, and made the explicit claim that it felt as though it did, all based on a program's code, do we believe it? How do we treat it? What are the ethics now needed? As we move further down the hall, in the next room, there is a woman named Mary. Mary has been contained in this room ever since she was born, completely closed off from the rest of the world. No one has gone in and she has never been let out. She has been communicated with exclusively through an intercom system. Inside the room, there is no color and there never has been. It is completely black and white. Her skin and hair have all been modified and dyed black, white, and gray. Through a delivery system, she has only been given food and drink, completely dyed with black and white food coloring. The only other things in the room that she has been given to pass the time are books and research papers, all also in black and white. Contained inside the books and papers is all of the known knowledge on one subject, color perception. Without having ever seen a color in her entire life, Mary has become an expert on color. She knows everything there is to know, the physics of it, the process by which different wavelengths of light stimulate the retina in the eye, how it triggers different electrical signals that affect neural activity in the brain, and how the brain interprets these signals into conscious experiences in the forms of different color perceptions. Soon, however, the door to Mary's room will be opened and she will be let out. For the first time in her life, she will see color firsthand. The question this experiment will then ask is when Mary leaves the room, will she learn anything new about color? If she already possesses and understands all of the known knowledge on color perception, is there still something unknown to her contained in experiencing it firsthand via the eye? This experiment, referred to as Mary's Room, attempts to demonstrate what is known as the knowledge argument, which is the claim that there are truths related to conscious experience that cannot be described or known by mere knowledge of physical facts. In other words, there is a property of knowledge and understanding that can only be found through first-hand conscious experience, which, according to the argument, extends beyond the mere physicality of the experience. This argues against the theory known as physicalism, which is the counter view that argues that everything in the universe, including mental states, is physical with physical explanations. The belief that Mary will experience and learn something novel when seeing color for the first time might seem obvious, but if she does, what exactly is it that is new? If the experience is tied to something physical, she, at least theoretically, should have already known. If it is not physical, what is it? Is it the mental state felt by the color? But what is being felt other than the physical state in the brain that the color produces in the form of a mental state, which again, Mary should have, or at least could have, already known? If she knows all the characteristics of a mental state through knowledge, wouldn't she already know how it feels? Perhaps then, this experiment is and will remain restricted by the limits of language and knowledge itself. Perhaps rather than any ineffable quality of subjective conscious experience, Mary will demonstrate that language as a vehicle of thought and understanding is simply far too limited to get near the mental state equivalent to first-hand experience. But nonetheless, theoretically, with advanced enough language, it would be possible. As we move down to the end of the hallway, in the final room is you. Your brain currently floats in a stasis tube of nutrient solution. Wires are implanted into it and plugged into a machine that actively processes and stimulates all of your brain's nerve impulses. Everything you are experiencing right now is mapped, modeled, and created by this machine. Your brain being stimulated into sequences of various mental states that reproduce your regular perceptions. You are not in the world as you think you are. You are not in your body. You are not physically encountering any environment through any senses. Your memory is actively being altered and updated to create cohesiveness in the story you imagine about yourself in order to make this illusion completely and constantly believable. Of course, all of these are just thought experiments, but the point of this last one is to pose the question, how can you know for sure? How can you know that all of the aforementioned, the VAT, the lab, the neuroscientist, and so on, isn't actually happening right now, and what you think is happening right now actually isn't. What can you really know with certainty to be true? 
Can you be certain that anything exists outside your mind? Can you be certain of the nature and conditions of your mind? Can you be certain your senses are not deceiving you, that you are awake and not dreaming, that you are in the real world and not a simulation, or a vat? Isn't the only thing you can be certain of is that you are somewhere, somehow, in something, existing as a thinking thing? Since all your abilities to think and know occur exclusively inside your mind, there is no way for you to ever step out of it to know or prove of anything else. All of the ideas and questions found in this hallway of thought experiments, the Chinese room created by John Searle in 1980, Mary's room created by Frank Jackson in 1982, and the brain in a vat created by Gilbert Harmon in 1973, inspired by Rene Descartes' evil demon, reveal the inherent difficulty of understanding the mind from within the mind. They reveal how little we truly know about what makes us who we are. They reveal the potential limits of thought, language, and knowledge as vehicles fast and powerful enough to transcend the bounds of their origins. And perhaps most beautifully, they reveal the brain's desire and ability to try anyway, to experiment with itself in novel ways and to use the material of its own thinking to try to manufacture new vehicles capable of doing so, of reaching into new realms of the unknown. This video was sponsored by Blinkist. Consciousness is an utterly perplexing place to exist. Likely ever since the first brain realized it was a brain, it has long since struggled to make sense of what this is, of who we are. Philosophers and scientists seemingly lack any real certainty about how and why consciousness works. Why does the brain produce the experience of self? Is it a primary function or an emergent property? Is consciousness unique to humans? If so, why? If not, how vast is it? And how do physical states in matter produce subjective personal experiences at all? All of these questions and more are discussed, challenged, and responded to in Annika Harris's book, Conscious, which you can find a succinct yet comprehensive summary of on the book summary app, Blinkist. Blinkist works by condensing over 5,000 books into around 15-minute summaries that can be read or listened to. Perhaps you are interested in learning about some of the aforementioned questions, but aren't sure you want to invest the several hours required into reading the full book. Blinkist helps solve this problem by allowing you to explore and discover meaningful insights from a wide range of books at a tiny fraction of the time. Blinkist has 27 categories to choose from, making it great for just about anyone's interests. If you're interested in learning more about the mind, Blinkist also has many other great titles, like Making Sense by Sam Harris, Being You by Anil Seth, and The Brain by David Eagleman. Additionally, Blankus also has summaries of popular podcasts as well as complete audiobooks, allowing you to delve even further into the books and topics you're interested in, all in the same place. If you're interested, use the link in the description and you'll receive one free week of unlimited access as well as 25% off a premium membership. The free seven-day trial can be canceled at any time within the trial period. And of course, thank you so much for watching in general and see you next video.